For a Maddich Monday is ESPN College Football Insider and expert Trevor Maddich, who is looking very, very dapper. The beard. Trevor, you got the off-season beard going. Compliments to you on that. Well, my wife likes it. I told her that she is the owner and the operator of this beard, so it's all up to her. But I don't know. What do you guys think? Should I keep it? Heck yeah, dude. You, you don't you don't have the honor code office telling you you can't. I'm a fan. <laughs> I, I'm a fan. Okay. Listen, I'm excited about this, though, because at BYU, I got too big for my britches my freshman year and tried to grow a little mustache, and it was weak and pathetic. And Lavelle Edwards one day called me into his office, and he said, okay, uh, have you done with a mustache? And I said, yes, sir. It went <laughs> shaved it off. So this is the, the next time I've had it. So I, I was pretty traumatized. Hey, it's it's all culminated in this, which it, it looks great now. And uh, with that in mind, Trevor, in the offseason, that doesn't mean there's not big offseason news happening or at least some speculation as it pertains to what Notre Dame Athletic Director Jack Swarbrook recently said. And we want to get your opinion on his idea that by the mid-2030s, he believes a major college football realignment, a separation of sorts, is going to happen. He called it inevitable. Where do you think, the, or what do you think, I should say, about those comments from Jack Swarbrick? Is it inevitable? I don't know that it's inevitable. Uh, the impression I got when I read those comments were that he may be, rather than foretelling the future, be trying to to let people know what's going on. So if there's going to be a backlash, it'll happen now. It's like when Texas and Oklahoma left the Big 12 to join the SEC. It was sudden. It was just, okay, here it is, done deal, fait accompli. So I got the impression that that he wanted a national discussion. I don't know that, but that was my, my impression. But as you look at the forces that are moving now in college football, the inertia, it all has to do with money. I mean, the, the, the money from broadcast partners and sponsors has gotten bigger and bigger. But now with NIL... And with the ability to pay players, there's a whole new infusion of cash. And some schools are benefiting from that at a much higher level than other schools. And so uh, you can see big changes coming because of that separation in the haves and have-nots. But having said that, I think we can, we can look at this as the logical conclusion of what didn't happen or extension of what didn't happen 15 years ago or so, when the universities could have gotten ahead of this whole NIL thing, this whole transfer portal where you don't have to sit out a year to, to transfer, all those different things, the universities did not get ahead of it. That means that the courts and politicians got ahead of it. And it's not that they have you know bad motives, it's that their motives are different from those of college football. So now what we're seeing is the effects on college football of the courts and politics leading the way instead of the universities, which I think they should have been doing 15 years ago. Now, it's interesting because it could be Division One that splits off. It could be Power 5 football only. Like, who knows, right? But yet, March Madness is super successful with a lot of schools that have nothing to do with, uh, you know, FBS or even Power 5 football. So it feels like that will always exist. March Madness is too, too powerful uh, um, an event for that to ever really be broken up. Yet, maybe we're just talking about football. I'm not sure. How do you see it potentially down the road? Could there be a football only situation here? I think that's the most likely thing, just because part of the reason for the, the movement now is that football and basketball, men's and women's, is driving the finances, and then the Olympic sports are being left behind. But I don't think it will be the disaster for Olympic sports if this does move towards super conferences and all this extra money and everything else that people that some people worry about. Just because the more money that comes into the university, the more money that comes into the athletic program because of football making a lot of money, the, the more that's available for the other sports. And I think there'll be a lot of talk about Title IX, about how it's distributed between men and women athletes, about how the, the, the football is getting so much richer and the other sports really are lagging behind. But it's not a matter – well, one way to look at it is that it's not a matter for the other sports of lagging behind football. It's will they elevate compared to where they were before. And so I think there's going to be a lot of big changes and there's going to be a lot of forces at work who have special interests of their own. But at the same time, you know, the more money that comes into the process, I don't think is the problem. It's the way that money gets managed. Trevor, let's keep it financial now. Would it be better to just embrace all of this NIL and big money and treat college athletics as big business? Should we just embrace that idea? Yeah, I think that's happening now. I mean, when we see NIL from this past season, for example, before the season, there were people on social media that were really worried 
about whether or not you're professionalizing their college stars, their favorite college stars. And you can just look as an example at Alabama's Bryce Young, right? And I'm just using him as an example here because his coach, Nick Saban, came out in a press conference and talked about, you know, seven figures NIL that he was receiving. And I, I really think Coach Saban was doing that just to make sure that recruits knew that you can make a lot of money in NIL at Alabama, right? That's what my opinion is. But when that happened, people thought that, oh no, I'm going to be looking at a professional athlete instead of an Alabama Crimson Tide quarterback. But once the season kicked off, I don't think anybody worried about that. They were excited to see Alabama play. And I think it'll be a similar thing here. The thing you've got to watch out for is, is who players now are beholden to. Because as NIL gets bigger and bigger, as agents and managers get involved to manage NIL, as they have the option to enter the transfer portal, even as a, you know, as a ruse to get more NIL money from the current school or the current school's boosters, as that stuff happens, who will the players really be working for? Will the coach be the final arbiter of their decision-making and their interface with football? Or will it be an agent? Will it be an NIL person? So these are things that we don't know. And as football becomes the bigger business that you're talking about, these are things that just have to shake out. As fans are concerned, I think the early NIL results didn't bother fans at all. But I think if, if players start to pull strings, which they might, it might sour the fans a little bit. We're talking to ESPN College Football Analyst Trevor Matich, who is a part-time mountain man as well now on BYU Sports Nation. Uh, Pat Forty, in his, uh, in his article, also mentioned this idea. Some schools who uh, the educational mission is still bigger than athletics and kind of run by academics uh, that also have athletics, but other schools, athletics kind of runs it, that perhaps others could es- essentially be spun off while retaining the school name and branding. Theoretical example, Oregon Ducks Athletics, Inc., what do you think that of that idea where maybe some schools could spin off and have its own sort of like the athletic department's not actually it's it's represented in name only maybe maybe by the university but makes money for it that's a that's an interesting idea to me yeah, well, on the financial side, a lot of that happens now. You get some of the bigger programs that do make money, and only the bigger programs make a lot of money. There's Most programs are struggling financially, but the big ones that make money very often have their own budgets. They're separate from the university. They don't take any money from the university. They take their income like it's an independent business, as if it were, and then they pay their expenses and then kick back money back, not kick back, but then donate money back to the university and the academic side. And so from a structure standpoint, the, the structure's kind of already there. I think the thing they've got to watch out for, though, is turning that kind of Oregon football ink, to use Pat Forty's example, into the players don't really have to go to school. They can if they want. They don't have to if they don't want. We're just going to pay them or we're going to put that big O on their helmet. I think that will then start to diminish what made college football great. Because college football isn't the NFL. It's not the XFL or the USFL. It's not a semi-pro league from a standpoint of how fans view it. But if, if as long as players go to school and as long as there's a requirement that they move towards graduation, at least there is that one element that these are student athletes. If you take away that element as part of, you know, Oregon Football Inc. in this example, mm. then all of a sudden you change. You, it becomes like the XFL. And I don't think Oregon fans in this hypothetical would see their team play Washington and see it the same way because it's not really kids that go to school. So they've got to be careful how they would structure the, the details of it, even though the, the financial structure at a lot of schools is already in place. Trevor, you're assuming high-profile college athletes go to class? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, to a degree, and self-delusion works for me. You know, I mean, th- this there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of nostalgia based on what people think this ought to be. You know, college football should be what it's always been. I don't know if it's ever always been the way people hope it is. The concept of amateurism and all that. But I think that that they've got to be careful not to destroy things that make college football great. Otherwise, that cash cow could change fundamentally in a negative way. Fantastic insight from ESPN's Trevor Maddich. On a scale of 1 to 10, Trevor, how confident are you that BYU would be involved in a Power 5 breakoff, meaning that the Cougars would be on the right side of things if and when that does happen? I'd say 6, maybe 7. It depends on the Big 12 and how they do 
uh, from a standpoint of, of viewers and, and finances without Texas and Oklahoma and with the infusion of the new programs, which are outstanding programs, by the way, uh, not just BYU, but the others that are coming into the Big 12. So that matters because the, there's speculation that this new Super League that may be formed wouldn't be all the Power Five conferences plus Notre Dame. There's speculation it could be 30 or 40 teams, and that's it, mm -hmm. right? So for BYU, they need to continue to prove their worth as a financial cash cow to that Super League that's looking to add teams. Well, who would they want to add? They'd want to add teams that make them money, right, and that are competitive. Well, BYU will be competitive. Right. But the question is, will they can, will they make them money? And that's what BYU will need to prove. And really what bring, BYU brings to the table is a national and international fan base. And that will have to be maximized and marketed to college football powers in order to put BYU in a good position, both as a member of the Big 12 or if uh, things break up in ways that are unforeseen in the future as an independent again. Trevor, let's finish with this. On April 25th, we're still a ways away from college football beginning in 2022, but we're starting to see preseason rankings trickle out post-spring, whatnot, between ESPN and SP Plus ratings, Fox Sports. BYU is typically in all of those top 25. So when the AP Top 25 comes out in August, do you believe BYU will be in the preseason AP Top 25 poll? They absolutely should be. I mean, right now in the e in the ESPN way too early top 25, they just came out at number 19. I think they should be higher than that because of all the returning production. And, you know, this defense, you know, which was held together by chewing gum and tinfoil at the end of the season <laughs> just because of so many injuries, returns a lot of key players. They've got a lot of those young guys that had to play are now coming in with a lot of experience and the depth will be better on defense. Offensively, this has a chance to be one of the greatest offensive lines that BYU's ever produced. And then there's an experienced quarterback. I mean, this is if they can perform well at the running back position by committee, or if somebody rises up to take the spot that Tyler Algier left when he went to the NFL, this BYU team should be better than it was last year. And so, yeah, I, I would see them ranked and I would see them ranked higher than 19 in the initial AP poll if they're paying attention. He is Trevor Maddich, and he is spreading the good word about BYU football as maybe a top 20 preseason team. Trevor, great to talk with you. Thanks so much for your time. We'll do it again soon. Thanks, guys. ESPN's Trevor Maddich on a Power 5 separation, major realignment, BYU in the preseason AP top 25. He covered it all. I don't care.